お待たせいたしました。Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for waiting. We would like to start plenary session three. Is it possible to achieve sustainable and inclusive economic growth? Allow me to introduce the uh, 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 people on the stage. On the left, moderator, Mr. Hiroshi Watanabe, President, Institute for International Monetary Affairs, panelist, Mr. Bill Emmert, Chairman, IISS. Mr. Nobu Inaba, Director and Chairman, Board of RICO Corporation. Mr. Adam Posen, President, Peterson Institute for International Economics. Mr. Yoshikawa, President of Rishu University. I would like to turn the microphone to Mr. Watanabe, the moderator, please. Well, thank you. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So we are very much. <coughs> Delighted to have the good panel here to that, and also they are very happy to see all of them is good friend of mine to that. So, <laughs> and the Bill has made very good remarks on that, and even though he said he's not so much pessimistic, but he pointed out the many difficulties to that, and also he stay away from the United Kingdom. That means <laughs> there would be some kind of disaster in the United Kingdom to that, and also. Not only for the United Kingdom, but I think, as he said, in the European continental country has each difficult situation to that. So the, even the Germany, I think the Grand Coalition would be facing some kind of difficulty to that. And the Italy, he said, the <coughs> I found some the split between the two populists, North rich populist and the South poor populist. And also Spain, that you know, the Barcelona or the Catalonia is going to have the movement of the independence to that. And also the UK has the election in the voting date is the 12th of December to that. So my worst scenario is that December 31st of this year, four country in the Europe doesn't have any effective cabinet. <laughs> Only for the French has the <coughs> continuation to that. But I think the... Uh, the Macron himself is not so much is good the ma management of the country to that. He tries to do something, but I think the, he is not capable to cover the entire European continent, even for the Brexit, uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland to that. So in that sense, I think the Europe uh, is now under the threat of the centrifugal power to that. That would be very much a difficult question to that, and the and also the relation between the United States and the Russia, or maybe all days in the Soviet Union. I think the Mr. Macron has pointed out the NATO is brain dead to that. For the Japanese, it sometimes NATO stands for the no action talk only, so <laughs> already brain dead situation to that. But I think the real situation, now the Mr. Trump is going to ask the European country to have the more the financial contribution to the <coughs> NATO operation to that. But I think NATO has its own difficulties. The recently, the Turkey is going to have some independent way to go on to that. And that the Russia has a good the handing, sh shaking hand with the Turkey to that. And even the Russia is going to extend hand to the even Saudi Arabia. The all the communist country and the absolute kingdom is going to have some good discussion to that. So in that sense, I think now we are living in the very, very the unique the time and also the just changing to that. So the the question is quite important and the, even though it is not so easy, but there the, <coughs> uh, Bill said that we are going to have to keep the liberal democracy and also the multinational corporation. So how to keep and how to extend the such kind of the uh, our joint power, our joint effort is quite important to that. So the, and I think the also the now we have the many unique leaders in every country to that. So the both side of the Atlantic Ocean, there's some critics said we have now the two Humpty Dumpty leaders on the both side of the Atlantic, United A and United B to that. And the, they, they have some kind of very the pop good popularity. The Humpty Dumpty sometimes to, to fall on, fall out of the world to that. But now the one of the Humpty Dumpty very likes to construct the world. So I think it's a very good situation to that. But I think now the <coughs> such kind of the 
unique leadership is going to have some turmoil to the, our the existing movement the coordination to that. So the, of course, the World Bank and IMF the operation is going to have not so much active to that. So the, even the G20 is going to see some kind of the hazard in the coming days, on, especially next year, the Saudi is going to host a G20. What kind of discussion they are going to have is very much good concern for us to that. So anyway, the, the bill has the, the listed up the many important the challenge for us to that. So now we are going to discuss on that. So the, now we are going to have a very good the panel from here to that. So the, I like to ask the, each of them for the, their own views and the comment to that. So the, and the strict timing for the 10 minute speech <laughs> is really welcome to that. So the first one is uh, Mr. Inabat. He is uh, the <coughs> going to discuss on, I, I think with some of the financial issues on the monetary issues on the, the novel opening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm the chairman of uh, the board of RICO. RICO, as you know, is a manufacturer of copying machine, and we have uh, 100,000 employees globally. It's, a, it's not a super huge uh, uh, company, but it's neither a tiny company. And I am at the helm of uh, uh, managing this company. And from that viewpoint, uh, I would like to share my findings and observation. It, my discussion is not necessarily restricted to financial matters, but allow me to proceed. Sustainable growth in the, uh, uh, is it uh, possible to achieve sustainable inclusive economic growth? That's the title. The world economy, the sustainability of the world economy's growth, and there's a grave concern against that. That's why we chose this title. When we look around the advanced economies, uh, as you can see here, uh, there's the uh, increasing income inequality, the loss of middle income class, and social division. These things are proceeding, destabilizing uh, the economy as a whole. Now, in the political scene, there's this extreme me firstism, my country firstism, hindering the free economic activities. In Japan, such problems are not so conspicuous as, as has been said. Uh, when we consider how good the corporate uh, uh, earnings are, uh, the uh, uh, actual employees are not benefiting much from uh, it in the form of wage increase. In the income inequalities, increasing income inequalities in the advanced uh, economies appears on the famous elephant chart uh, on the left. Uh, in the emerging countries, there are so many. On the right-hand side, a, a portion of the emerging uh, 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 countries, they are stable, but the, the income increases are remarkable for many people in the emerging economies, but for many of the middle income class in the advanced economies, the income has been squeezed for recent years. The fact that many people in the advanced economies are feeling that their standard of living has suffered stagnancy can be confirmed from this data. Uh, labor productivity growth in the advanced economy is slowing down. It's not uh, uh, leading to the wage increase. Uh, labor uh, uh, productivity is uh, the uh, driver for uh, the wage increase. So if the labor productivity remains low, that would not help the wage increase. In addition, labor share in the advanced economy is declining as a trend, leading to the further slower wage increases. Now, these uh, situation are there, and the businesses in the advanced economies, how are they reacting to this situation? One uh, example comes from uh, the uh, uh, statement issued by U.S. Business Roundtable on the August 19th this year. They used to uh, uphold the, uh, the shareholder primacy. They are discarding it. And now the business have tried to share commitment to all 
of the stakeholders, including customers, employees, suppliers, and local communities, as well as shareholders. I suppose that uh, this is in response to various criticism against the U.S. businesses. But what we are focusing on, well, this can be one answer to what we are uh, facing with. Oh, no. Many Japanese and European businesses have expressed their corporate management uh, attitude that they consider to provide benefit to all stakeholders. But nevertheless, they are still strongly influenced by the demands of shareholders. Particularly, it is undeniable that the businesses have been intimidated in the face of strong demands from shareholders for short-term high profits. Uh, let me cite some examples. In the credit market, excellent companies can raise uh, money by issuing bonds or borrowing from uh, banks. And the funding cost right now is around 1%. Thanks to the major countries' central banks' ultra-easy monetary policy. But on the other hand, in the stock market, the situation is different. Many shareholders are still demanding a high return on equity of 10% or more. And corporate executives cannot dare to disregard this demand because uh, directors will not be re-elected uh, in the shareholders' meeting. So what's happened as a result? What we're facing is the landscape of stagnant business investments. Since there are few new attractive investment projects satisfying a such high rate of return of 10% or more, the necessary business investments are not adequately done. Uh, Mr. Asso, finance minister, say why are corporates are hoarding money because consequently, unused funds have been accumulated as cash on hand of many corporates. The only way to avoid this is to buy back the shares they have already issued. The U.S. has not accumulated cash on hand, but in the U.S., uh, the share buyback has reached 88 trillion yen in last year. And in Japan, it is expected to reach 10 trillion yen this year. Uh, there are huge scales that reach 4% and 2% of GDP, respectively. And we can also face a similar situation in the development of wages. Tightening cost control leads to restraining wage increases and declining in the labor share. Even though the supply-demand condition in the labor market is tight, wages do not rise so much. And Price do not like uh, do not likely rise. After all, trying to meet the short term high profit demands of shareholders is not compatible with sustained investment and expansion of uh, employment. And what is worse, the shareholders' demand for short term high profit seems to be rather stronger in recent years. So, in my conclusion, the business in advanced economies should seek new corporate governance. In other words, uh, for the business must keep eyes on the requests of all shareholders and do not uh, uh, pursue short-term uh, profits. So instead of uh, trying to maximize short-term profit, uh, uh, they should consider stability of economies and societies and uh, orient toward the medium-term uh, uh, sustainable expansion of corporate value by executing sustainable investment and employment opportunities. The business should keep contributing to the economic prosperity of our societies. For shareholders as well, that orientation toward the medium long-term sustainable expansion would be more beneficial than seeking the short-term profit. In short, the business in advanced economy should build a more responsible capitalism, gaining 
better understanding of shareholders about departure from short-term horizon. Thank you very much. To all the stakeholder capitalism and also the stockholder capitalism through that. So the, the maybe turn of the century, the not only for the United States, many countries have more emphasis on the stockholder type of the operation to that. But now the many countries coming back to the stakeholder operation to that. So I think that could be, and also it is very much related to the issue of the inequality issues. So I think that is very much important one to that. So the, the later we will discuss much further to that. So I think next one is the Dr. Adam Posen. So the, and if you, then the floor is yours, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I'm very honored to be part of this distinguished panel, and I wish to thank Ambassador Sasai and the leadership of JIIA, not just for inviting me, but for taking on the idea of there being a Tokyo Global Dialogue. Japan, as we know, has been standing up in many ways in recent years, and it is great to see JIIA contribute to that moving forward. Um, I have some overlap with the previous speaker, although I come out in a slightly different place, it seems to me we need to address four questions. Can we have growth? Can it be inclusive? What will buy off the nasty politics if we get inclusive growth? And can international rules play a role in this? And I think I will give very brief replies on what I think on each of those topics and then give a perhaps overly optimistic, wishful reply for how we solve it all. Um, first, can we have growth? The answer is yes. Um, as Japan, in fact, has demonstrated since roughly 2003, uh, it has had, in per capita terms, quite solid economic performance, quite stable growth, only thrown off by the US and European financial crisis. A large part of this was the public sector, as my colleagues Olivier Blanchard and Takeshi Tashiro have argued. But it ultimately, as Mr. Naba said, comes down to the fact that we have seen a decline in the labor share of GDP across the world. And the only way to fix this is to not make competitive advantage out of crushing wages. I have been arguing this for several years. A kind friend in the audience today reminded me, or at least remembered, I remembered, that uh, in Japan, we argued for raising wages in Japan before cutting corporate taxes. And unfortunately, that was not pursued. We tried that in the U to argue that in the US, and again, it was not pursued. This is a choice, a political choice, and it can be pursued. I disagree with the statement, however, that it's a result of corporate governance, because in the, in, there's been very little progress in Germany or Japan, progress in quotes. Um, towards shareholder-dominated corporate governance, a little bit of reform in Japan, a little bit in Germany, but not enough to explain it. On the other hand, we have fewer public companies in the U.S. now than at any time in our modern history. The Wilshire 5000 Index only has 3,500 companies or so now because so many companies have gone private, yet the wage share keeps going down. So the issue is not one of corporate governance alone, at least, and I think we need to look elsewhere. Can that growth, if we have wage-driven growth, be inclusive? I think yes. Uh, I think, again, I would praise Japan, in particular Prime Minister Abe's leadership in womenomics. I was one of the first Western economists to, to take it seriously and suggest it would have a major effect. Um, and it has exceeded even my optimistic expectations. And this is a critical point that we have in every country, every major advanced economy, underutilized human capital. In Japan, it was egregiously the underutilization of educated women, and there's still room to improve. In the US, it's the underutilization of people of color, including women. In Italy, it is underutilization of young people. One can go country by country. But even if that is not an ongoing source of new productivity growth, which of course would be lovely, you can still make sustainable growth for several years by making better use of your own people. And that is worth doing and can get us quite far and by its nature is inclusive. But that gets to the politics. And here I disagree with something uh, Chairman Emmett said earlier, which is that it's not that we have um, increasing insecurity as a new phenomenon or at least a new phenomenon in the post-war. 
it is the insecurity of, in the U.S., the white males of, of the Midwest. It is the people of, of the North in England. It is various groups that are, have been privileged and who have never had to adjust before are now being forced to adjust and compete. Whereas we know that, for example, in the U.S., African Americans or single women were always insecure in their work, were always forced to adjust. The political backlash only came when it was the white male or their equivalent, the less educated white male in each country was forced to be treated like everybody else. And so the inclusion is actually, in the end, somewhat only be justice if those groups are subjected to more competition and more adjustment. And so the political challenge, as we've seen with Brexit, as we've seen with votes for right-wing parties in Europe, in Western Europe, excuse me, as well as the East, is not about the absence of a welfare state, not about the absence of jobs, but about the relative status of these privileged groups. And so that makes it harder. Growth alone is not going to buy these people off. In Germany, we have seen very good growth for 30 years, no, excuse me, for, for, for 15 years. Um, but it's not, at the, it's not been enough to keep the right wing from rising. There is economic nationalism, and obviously this is not solely economically determined. So how do international rules play a role in all this? I think it is important to recognize, of course, all the underlying forces of bipolarity or multipolarity, of technological shifts, of changes in the international system, which were so excellently discussed yesterday. But in the economic sphere, I would make two points be in addition. The first is, just as with constitutions domestically, the international arrangements made in the 40s by the U.S. leadership reflected certain coalitions and realities of the world at that time. We need to adapt the rules to the current time. And that, of course, means not only empowering China, but also increasing the fluidity of the rules in various ways and changing what is covered. Now, it's a huge topic, and many people have opinions on that, but I would just suggest that the second piece is the norms. It's not so much that there is a Chinese model people aspire to. It's the fact that there is no model, and, and Chairman Ahmed, I think, did a very nice job in his opening remarks of talking about the sense of ennui or disappointment or disengagement that is throughout much of the rich democratic world. And I think here is where Japan in particular can play a role with the European Union. Rather than choosing between China and the US or being schizophrenic on that point, I think moving with Europe as they've done on trade, as they're doing on COP25 and environment, is a way forward to set a different set of norms that is neither the American nor the Chinese, or might be the best of what used to be the American but is no longer the American. My final point, which is my most optimistic and wishful, is we are at the perfect economic moment, given all of this, to undertake massive decarbonization efforts, to do a huge spread of public investment, to employ people in this effort, to destroy capital, frankly, the value of capital for a lot of rich entrenched interests, and create new capital. This would be akin to the rebuilding after World War II akin to the rebuild, the building initially of the railroads after the, the civil war in the US. It will be disruptive, but it ultimately serves a good purpose, and there is fiscal room to do it, given how low interest rates are. And I think that has to be the international agenda going forward. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Adam. So you have raised the four points, and uh, I have have some of the rosy views in the future, so that's <laughs> the, and also we will discuss further to that. And the, the final the panelist is the Professor uh, Hiroshi Yoshikawa. So now the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I feel so honored to be invited. So. Well, however, my specialty is economy, 
Therefore, I would like to limit my talk on the theme of this economy and economics. So, including Japan, the West in, is now uh, suffering from this uh, deadlock type feeling. People are really uh, in the depressed state. Why such a situation is uh, filled with a sense of deadlock? Because basically there's a low growth rate as well as a gap inequality expanding, and there may be other problems as well. But these two issues are major problems that uh, democratic world or the West is currently faced with. So the issue is that uh, it's not just limited to Japan. And of course, in Japan, I think, uh, of course, I like to focus on Japan in that sense. Because in Japan, we are talking about the low economic growth, and we often say that uh, a demographic problem Currently, the Japanese population is about 120 million, and 100 years later, it will shrink to 50 million. That's the government estimate. Uh, so this is really a huge transition. In other words, for the mankind history, this is unprecedented change in the demography. So in that context, Population is declining, and positive growth is not likely. It's a type of atmosphere or way of thinking uh, people seem to have uh, uh, in Japan. However, let us think about it with a cold head. In other words, population reduction is not really a, a negative factor, uh, is it? It's true in many ways, but per capita GDP is very important in many countries. That change in quantitative way is most impactful or significant. We all of you here are quite fully aware during the economic high growth period in Japan. Every year, Japan enjoyed 10% of the growth per annum, but population growth was only 1% per annum. That is to say, 10 to 1, in other words, 9% difference per capita GDP increased per annum. Uh, that is as much as 9% per year. What about China, our neighbor country? Now they say it's a new normal, 6% annual growth. Or well, recently, due to the, Jap the China-US trade war, maybe 6% is not likely to be achieved in China. But until recently, they enjoyed 10% per annum of uh, growth, as you are aware. So the China itself, it happens to uh, be that during the 10% growth period, the population growth rate was only 1%. In other words, 10 minus uh, the 1, in other words, annually, 9% annual per capita GDP growth was achieved. Now, in the new normal, 10% growth rate uh, uh, down to 6%, uh, but the population growth has not declined in China. In case of Japan, in 1970s, the 10 reduced to 4%. That was a growth rate reduction. But population growth rate did not decline at the same time. Per capita, GDP growth rate went down. That was something uh, that really happened. So in terms of demography and uh, accompanying aging, that is now a huge problem. But uh, the, is it impossible for us to continue growth? That is a fallacy. Because why do people say there's no growth? Lack of innovation, I think, is the real cause of uh, lack of growth. And of course, uh, Mr. Inaba talked about that. That's one issue, lack of innovation. The second is inequality or the gap. As Bill touched upon this problem of inequality as well, the irregular workers, uh, the uh, workers, and their share has increased versus the regular workers. So irregular employment is the problem. That's true in Japan. But uh, in Japan and uh, other, other Western countries, this as a cause of the uh, expanding gap is the aging that is related to this increasing inequality. As to the cause of this inequality, many people talk about different theories, but due to the lack of time, I wouldn't touch upon the details. 
But the gist of it is that in case of Japan, after the collapse of bubble economy, the problems seem to uh, be lingering. In addition to Asian problem, the companies are still suffering from that uh, impact of the collapse of the bubble economy, and their behaviors are influenced by that. In 2008, the uh, financial crisis was the major uh, uh, the cause which uh, brought the lingering effect. And uh, its uh, legacy and scars are still being felt by many countries, as uh, Bill touched upon. But in case of Japan, 2008 crisis, as well as uh, I think 1990s at the beginning, there was a major collapse of bubble economy, and that impact is still being felt as a major scar. In 2008, or the bubble collapse and it's uh, uh, the scars. One of those scars is that the current the financial policy or in conjunction with this uh, the uh, monetary policy as a debt problem, another fiscal deficit and the, uh, the financial policy as well as the, uh, the, the national government bond which was accumulated over the years. So that problem is still in front of us as the major the crisis. Finally, what uh, I have to emphasize is that our economy is changing. Western capitalism is changing, as uh, many people pointed out, and I agree. Actually, this is not new. This has been said uh, in the past repeatedly. What I want to emphasize is that after the World War II end, Schumpeter, the very famous economist, made a very famous speech. The title of his speech was, Can Capitalism Survive? There was a very famous lecture, a speech, and Schumpeter raised this issue. He said, ladies and gentlemen, the answer is no. That was a very famous uh, speech he made. Can capitalism survive? That was a question raised by Schumpeter. In response to that, uh, at around 1950s, famous economists are asking question, did uh, uh, capitalism change already? And many books were written on this. Is one very interesting book I would like to share with you. A very old book uh, published in Japan back in 1950s. A Japanese uh, businessman went to uh, the United States in a delegation and met with the U.S. management. Uh, and he asked question about uh, the capitalism after the World uh, War II. Uh, Mr. Towata, uh, the uh, disciple of the uh, Schumpeter, wrote a book. Uh, this is the chronicle of the uh, U.S. Uh, capitalisms. Uh, this has been stopped being published, uh, unfortunately, but it's a very interesting book. At around 1950, the American management uh, managers talked to the Japanese managers, what they told the Japanese managers. How is it like? It was totally different from what we regard as American capitalism. Decades ago, Japanese-style management was much talked about, and what the American managers said back in the 50s was exactly the same. American managers in the big corporations said in unison after the World War II, American capitalism changed for the better. Before the war, there was a capitalism that's different post-war. And capitalism now is like this and this and this, they told Japanese managers. And what they said was very similar to what is known as Japanese-style management. Uh, we used to uh, talk about changes. Are, uh, times are changing, and the capitalism seems to be facing a new stage. Finally, one word about China. Allow me. 
I am not a Chinese. I'm not an expert in Chinese, but as I imagine in my mind, Chinese people, the leaders, are they feeling a sense of stagnation? Maybe not. Their economy, uh, despite all those problems, are likely to grow. Why? Per capita income level in China remains low, but this cannot uh, uh, last for long. Naturally, they want to achieve the Western level of income, and they will catch up. They have the right. They are entitled to it, and they are capable of doing it, in my view. So China is uh, going to grow uh, in their mind, and furthermore, the Chinese people there have this 3,000 years of history, 1840s from the Opium War. There was 100th year's anniversary. There was an anomaly in their mind, in their history. So China, based on this 3,000 years of history, would like to go back to that prestigious status that they used to hold in the past. So as I imagine, Chinese people in their mind, are they feeling the sense of stagnation that there's no way out? Uh, most likely not. They don't feel that way in my mind. I'm sorry, I, I just uh, went over my allotted time. Sorry. Well, the thank you, Hiro. ありがとうございました。吉川先生。人口動態、そして人口の話をなさいました。偶然ですが、ドイツもまた第5次産業。日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日本で、日
Second is, in Japan, it is not everyone is getting poorer. As Professor Yoshikawa pointed out, per capita income has been growing in Japan. So, so you cannot have everybody simultaneously getting poorer while per capita income is going up. Thirdly, uh, Mr. Inaba had mentioned the, the uh, el famous elephant chart. It turns out the elephant chart is actually, as pointed out by a former colleague of mine at Peterson and by the Resolution Foundation in the UK, is actually highly distorted. Uh, most of the decline in middle class world incomes comes from Russia and the former Soviet Union and then the Japanese recession of the 1990s. If you just take those out, it actually looks more like a snake than an elephant. So uh, let, people are angry, but let's not be too economist about it. They may be angry for reasons having nothing to do with the economics, and the economics is an excuse. Well, thank you very much. So the bill, the after this listening to the, the views from the three panelists, do you have another additional or another new insight? <laughs> Well, I, I, I think it has been an excellent set of contributions. I think that um, maybe I'll add one framing point that we haven't yet mentioned, just uh, w um, which is that uh, you know, in, if, if we were in a different conference in a different, with different panelists, we probably would be claiming or proclaiming that we were in the period of fastest gr innovation and technological change in world history. This would be, of course, uh, considerably um, Hyperbolic. It would be. Uh, it would be uh, um, historically somewhat naive. Countries always think, or um, e eras always think, that they're doing things faster than previous uh, eras. But nevertheless, we are in a in a period of a of a uh, productivity paradox where we do have technological progress taking place, but we have simultaneously uh, low growth of productivity and, in particular, low growth of earnings uh, uh, power. So I think. In our discussion, we perhaps it would be useful to connect these uh, points. Uh, one reason why these things can coexist is because, although technical progress is an important ingredient of obviously of economic uh, pro change, it is cannot s so single-handedly determine um, uh, activity. And uh, it's worth noting that in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, there was also great technological progress. Um, but we still had a Great Depression. But secondly, I think it, it lies somewhat, uh, and I agree very strongly with, uh, with uh, uh, Adam Posen in his, uh, in his uh, uh, analysis, uh, that uh, alongside this technological progress, we've had two other phenomena. One is declining public investment, and very weak public investment. Also, somewhat declining business investment, but actually not, not as weak as public investment, typically. Um, and secondly, we've had uh, depressed real incomes uh, and, and wage levels in many countries around the world. And Japan, absolutely, um, in much of the past three decades, has been uh, in all of those uh, categories. Uh, maybe less the public investment, but, all, but uh, nevertheless, it has been declining in recent years. And looking at it in policy terms, I think we should focus on one, human capital and the deployment that's related to it of technology. Um, and I absolutely firmly believe that, that in each country it's a different factor, but in this country a lot of it is to do with uh, gen the gender inequality issue and the, and the uh, deployment of the increasing numbers of well-educated uh, fe uh, female professionals and unprofessionals, but also non-regular workers. But in all countries, a lot to do with direct government intervention to raise wages and to uh, in intervene in labor markets. And thirdly, as Adam absolutely rightly says, there's a great case for increased public investment. Um, decarbonization is probably the right theme of our times to guide that, uh, that, uh, that uh, happening. And it's worth pointing out that um, in Europe, we have currently the biggest political question in Europe is not Brexit even though the English are uh, so self-centered that we think it's Brexit, it's actually the succession to the Grand Coalition in Germany, and in particular the succession to Chancellor Merkel. We've seen in the last few days the Social Democrats elect left-wing um, leaders. 
almost certainly that is going to mean that the coalition between Merkel and the Social Democrats falls apart. The successor to that will be or either elections first or, or maybe a minority government, but either way, it's pretty likely to be a coalition involving the Green Party, who are the most popular uh, party in Germany. Us optimists in Europe hope that the Green Party, together with the Christian Democrats, will follow the Posen uh, model <laughs> and lead a process of public investment in Europe um, uh, centered around decarbonization. So it may happen, uh, I hope. Well, thank you very much, Suzy. Now that we are going to have a discussion among us first, and the, I have one question to Leo to that. So the uh, fate of West, fall of West, where end of West, anyway, we discuss on the West and the East framework to that. But I think for the big mass of the population in the Southeastern Asia and the South Asia and the Western Asia, nearly uh, 3.5 billion population to that, for them, from the north is the Russia and China. From the east, United States. From the west, Europe. So now we are going to have a little different framework of the global discussion on that. How do you think about it? <laughs> well, I, 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 <laughs> I think that's right. We had, these geographic terms are very uh, European-centric and we need to, Atlantic-centric, and we probably need to evolve away from them over time. But also, I think the point you raise is, uh, comes back to a point I men mentioned that uh, it, in today's world, no country can really choose sides and needs relationships with all countries. Uh, and that makes it harder to have what you might call a values-based uh, diplomacy and a values-based policy based around liberal democracy. Um, and harder because, because Clearly, if you need a, a close relationship with China uh, uh, in the north, uh, and maybe Russia, and also democracies east and west, then uh, you, need, you have to make some compromises. Nevertheless, I would say that what each country also needs is, in a way, a clear identity in both for their own population and in the world about who they are and what do they stand for. Uh, and values, and the, the point of liberal democracy has to be about those values, and also somewhat the, the liberal democratic point is about the continuity of values. Uh, and dictators come and go, but democracies typically follow fairly consistent long-term trajectories. So I would say the merit of having, if you like, a, a stronger network involving liberal democracies than the ones north and south that you have to do with your, um, with, with non-liberal countries is that uh, the, is the hope based on history that those networks will be more, will be longer term and more, more coherent. Now that's why the current events, particularly with, with Donald Trump, but also in some European countries have shaken that faith in the long-term consistency of, of, uh, of policy. Um, uh, and so I, we have to accept that that has shaken that faith. So there's a good example maybe is how do we deal as, far as, as, as outsiders with the Hong Kong protests? Um, personally, I think we should uh, absolutely say that the Hong Kong protesters have every right to wish their constitution in the basic law and the, uh, and the Sino-British Joint Declaration to be stuck, to be adhered to by China during the period of one country, two systems, and other countries should say that. But it isn't that easy to, to do that. I can compare us as governments, but in our identities as countries, that's what we should do, um, because that is what we think we stand for as countries. Um, and uh, my country has not always been very good at doing that. Um, indeed, Hong Kong is typically say that the British just sell their souls for a few uh, pieces of silver to China. Um, and I think it's a dilemma also for Japan, but I would like uh, to think that we should be standing up to the Hong Kong protesters. Okay, thank you very much on that, Sudi. For the other of these panelists, do you have any additional comment or other issues to that, Sudi? I think the still the many 
uh, the people in the world had the confidence for the liberal democracy, but they, after the GFC, the people are somewhat frustrated with the slowness and the inefficiency. And the AI and IoT is going to accelerate the pace of change on that. But the decision of the government is getting slower and slower. Such kind of the gap is going to have some kind of frustration. So even for the democratic country says the, yeah, for example, the Mr. Trump says the US, um, America first to that. America first or the British first, every country says my country first, that is okay. But sometimes it becomes US only. That could have some the eroding of the multilateral system to that. So the, how we are going to change such kind of trend is quite important issue to that. So th if you have some comment on the issues to that. As the token American on the panel, I guess I should say something. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not America first. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I feel very strongly what Bill Emmett was just saying, as, as I've said in other contexts, um, much in the same spirit. Well, uh, it's also a, 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 a quote from Tocqueville, um, what makes America great is its willingness to do good, and if it stops doing good, it ceases to be great, or roughly speaking, that's the Tocqueville, I don't remember exactly. So it is ultimately about the values. And so when we talk about the U.S. government and the conflict that uh, Minister Watanabe rightly raises with the multilateral system, this is why I emphasize the EU-Japan relationship as, I think, the bulwark and in the economic sphere especially. So I would suggest two things. So for example, um, the Trump administration is trying to kill the appellate body in the WTO, the, the means of enforcing on disputes and, and adjudicating disputes. And there's been a very clear proposal on the table that essentially the WTO should set up a appellate body minus one that all the members except the U.S., if the U.S. is going to behave this way, should de facto set up one without the U.S. And there's some legal niceties about the U.S. being a member, so you can't quite do that, but you can make essentially a civil contract treaty amongst all the other countries and say, we're going to keep running the appellate body between the rest of us, even if the U.S. ignores it. And Japan has, Japanese government has been reluctant to go forward with this, even though the EU pushes it because they're worried about offending Trump and all that. And uh, again, it's similar to what Bill was saying on uh, Hong Kong, although less morally charged. Um, I think it would be wise for Japan to join with the EU and Australia and Canada and a few others and go ahead. Um, similarly, internet, you mentioned, Minister, the, the IoT and AI. I mean, I think we're seeing very clearly that the US not just for Trump reasons, in part because the government is very slow, as you say, um, not behaving well on privacy issues. And the Europeans obviously have a different standard. In fact, at least on paper, the Chinese have a different, better standard in, ter in terms of what at least the internet companies are allowed to do with users' data. And there again, there is some cost if, if the US goes the wrong way and it can't be perfect, but there can be agreements on higher standards on privacy that do not, US cannot veto. We have people can choose to do that. And so I, I think the way forward is it's going to have to be a patchwork and globalization doesn't have to go into retreat. It will be corroded. There will be holes in it. The, the network will be frayed. But there are things that the EU and the and Japan and even the UK can do to patch the patch the fraying of various pieces. All right, thank you. Uh, please. Hello. Thank you very much. May I comment? Thank you. Uh, I'm not a specialist on the international politics, but uh, in the world of economy the U.S. role is something that I have uh, studied uh, over several decades, and let me reflect upon that. 
In 1960, the GATT Kennedy Round negotiation took place, as you recall. And we, the economists, felt that America had a leadership in the post war period. It's a success case of the GATT. And we often talk about that success story. That was true at that time. But in 1970s, of course, during the Cold War era, as you recall, that the oil embargo took place. It was called as oil crisis, oil shock in Japan, as I recall, in France. Uh, maybe the president discarded this time, or the, whoever the president there. Well, they felt a crisis at that time on behalf of the West. Oil prices escalated significantly. At that time, the Soviet Union, current Russia, at that time, is an oil producer. It has the abundant resources. It's an oil-rich country. So the West felt a crisis. Initially, it used to be G5, uh, the summit meeting, as Mr. Otanabe remembers well, and G6 or whatever. They had a smaller framework established in 1970s after the oil shock or oil crisis. In 1980s, in Japan, just like China today, Japan, U.S., the fierce trade friction occurred. When we recall that, at least the Japanese economists or Japanese government officials at that time did not believe all the American statements were reasonable at that time. Because at that time, the US did not use a certain wording, but the, the attitude represented America first in their request or demand to Japan. So that's our understanding. However, 1980s, the trade friction was a sort of a, a trigger point and Japan in, had a bubble economy, there might be some cause effect relationship according to many economists. But in 1990s, economically, Japan became stagnant in terms of its economy. On the other hand, at that time, what about the Asian developing countries and uh, our bilateral relationship? There used to be Washington consensus, a word used at that time with regard to many economic policies, IMF and uh, in Washington, D.C., and the thought created in Washington, D.C. were regarded as global standards. So the word like global standard was used. Anyway, that was this uh, trend or uh, flow. And uh, after the year 2000, we uh, continued on. As we've been talking about the Mr. Trump's and uh, Mr. Trump, he's a unique one for sure. After Mr. Trump became a president, the U.S. has changed significantly. But when you think of the long history of the U.S. in the post-war period, the U.S. leadership has been going through the evolution or change in the long term. And that has eventually reached to the current state, according to my interpretation. So in the discussion today, uh, we talked about other important issues other than just economy, for example, gender issue, which is very important here. And as this uh, Mr. Emmott said, that the investment and spending is more than, rather than the private sector investment, maybe public spending is very important. And I agree to those views. But uh, what about politics? Are there politicians and politics capable enough to control that public spending? Lots of people feel strange about that, um, maybe mistrust of the political leaders. So, so I do not agree to your conclusion if it comes to one that uh, you depend upon uh, the politics. But maybe private sector industry should also contribute to a solution of these challenges. Otherwise, we cannot enjoy any progress. That's my feeling. 
But what's our weapon? Well, technology innovation could show us a solution. Technology innovation might cause some problems, side effects, but it could do some good. As the, the pose, uh, Professor Posen talked about gender issue here in Japan, clearly the women have to go through and uh, they have to go through the lots of uh, the burden like uh, the long-term care as well as the child care and lots of uh, inequalities, especially the young generation women as well. But recently, the, uh, the Japanese government is promoting a policy to change the way of work and the work style change. And then, of course, uh, I do not know how hard it is supported, but homework or the, the work to be shifted at home. Lots of people choose to work at home instead of going to office. For some time, we uh, talked about this, how to maybe uh, improve the office work at uh, offices computer and internet were introduced technologically uh, that you don't have to commute to work uh, people can stay at home but how can you manage and control the workforce who keep working at home maybe that was a difficulty to implement it but thanks to digital technology progress uh, you can manage the workers at home so sns a group chat and all these things are used uh, by individuals. But maybe you can apply that to company level. So home workers, they can always communicate and keep in touch with uh, the supervisors, managers, and colleagues at the office. So it's a real-time communication, now feasible, possible. And the manager, supervisors can watch over that. And so he can make sure that he, this worker is not uh, in the, the golf course instead of a uh, homework, because they can always check. And then uh, you can always collate it with this uh, work performance evaluation sheet and so on. So rapidly, because of this technology, home work is now uh, uh, becoming prosperous. When the baby gets uh, feverish and then uh, the mother cannot work, or then the grandpa, grandma uh, ha, uh, now these, uh, uh, has an injury and then you have to take them to the hospital and so on. Uh, because of that, a uh, person uh, can keep working at home. So. Uh, that uh, home work, uh, work at home can become more effective, which could reduce the burden upon the women as well as the burden upon the, some men, because men can even work at home as well. So inequality and gap could be minimized or alleviated. It's a social phenomenon, I think. Uh, this is an example that the technological advancement uh, could help the companies and employees to alleviate their burdens, and these examples are ample. I would like to emphasize this point. I wanted to add uh, to these excellent comments that um, uh, particularly to do with the question about how whether we can rely on politicians to guide public investment uh, very successfully. I would say a, as a general point, in a way the tragedy of political economy is that we need governments unfortunately, to do things, even if they do them badly. Um, and uh, I do think that, uh, of course, um, there's good reason to think that uh, many public interventions, both with investment spending and with uh, regulation, uh, will often be very imperfect and may be, uh, can be badly done. But ever since... Um, uh, the great Scottish economist Adam Smith wrote in the uh, 1770s his Wealth of Nations, we recognize that governments are unfortunately necessary <laughs> to uh, provide the framework uh, and uh, to provide, in some cases, um, investments that, that, a public, uh, that the private sector cannot do and would not do. Uh, so I think it has to be both. Um, really, public investment is needed in cases where you need um, to exploit the borrowing costs of government. You need to, the low borrowing costs, you to exploit uh, the willingness to take a very long-term view, to exploit um, a willingness to, or, uh, to, to not worry about short-term profits and, and shareholders uh, and provide a framework, but then a framework within which the, public, the private sector clearly need to make, make uh, their operations. And it's the same w with uh, investment in wage, uh, so intervention in the labor market in, in wages. Uh, the private sector on their own absolutely want to reduce their labor costs, and uh, they're right to do so. 
but governments cannot stand by, should not stand by and allow that uh, to simply happen because actually it, it, it uh, is negative for the economy as a whole uh, as well as for political issues. So I think there has to be intervention in both cases. Well, thank you very much, Andre. So <coughs> time is running so fast, so that, but the rest of the 15 minutes would be open for the floor to the speak. So if you have any question, raise a hand and identify yourself, and the question would be crispy, I hope. My name is Hara. Uh, so I, I'm teaching at the Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. Uh, I've got a question to Mr. Emot and Yoshikawa Sensei. Uh, the same question to, to both, of the, both of you. Before that, uh, I'd like to appreciate uh, Mr. Emot's excellent, uh, deep, uh, deeply thought uh, keynote speech today. I learned a lot from your keynote speech. Thank you very much indeed for that. My question is uh, twofold. One is, uh, uh, say, uh, d before that, say, some panelists were talking about uh, the existence of the big gap or increasing gap between the rich and the poor uh, at, the, uh, at the background of uh, the erosion of the international order today. And in this regard, uh, there are two ideas uh, which have been uh, expressed and uh, presented by in the last few decades. Uh, one is Tobin tax. Of course, everybody knows that, and uh, rich people can manage to use, uh, uh, keep their money in tax havens and so forth, and money makes money in the, say, commodity markets or, say, stock exchange, by using I AIs, and in a few seconds, uh, they are selling and buying things. So small percentage of Tobin tax uh, imposed on the international transaction of money may make some changes. I'd like to get your uh, views, personal say, comments on this idea. And the second one is, uh, second point is, uh, say, Thomas Piketty's uh, uh, ideas uh, of, uh, say, expressed in his book uh, Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, he suggested, I, I, I think, uh, uh, that uh, uh, some progressive, a little bit more progressive income tax uh, uh, sh should be imposed, and also very small percentage of uh, some wealth tax, a uh, little bit progressive. These are very radical ideas, I know, but I'd like to get your personal views on uh, uh, these two points uh, by Mr. Emot and uh, Yoshikawa Sensei. Get to the bill first. I'm sure that Mr. Posen should really uh, be, be, uh, be, be asked to these questions, but, but uh, let me offer my, my view, I mean, uh, which is, I think, probably the same as Adam would say, that, uh, or some of it. Uh, I think direct in intervention in the labor market and uh, to increase earnings is a more, would be a more powerful way to deal with inequality and to deal with, to deal with the general uh, effect on, on, uh, on, um, on, on economies of inequality and insecurity and of the declining labor share that uh, Inaba-san uh, 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 talked about. Um, I think that um, actually it's true over history that uh, democracies have responded to inequality by massive investment. But the most effective ones are often by educational investment um, that, that have improved social mobility and improved human capital that enable people to, uh, to earn enough to, to then mean that these inequalities uh, erode rather than tax-based um, tax uh, interventions. And I would concentrate on the deployment of human capital and in particular the ability of that, that, that us humans to earn money um, uh, through direct in interventions. The Tobin tax has its, has its disadvantages, uh, particularly in an era of mobile capital, it's very difficult to, to actually do, but I don't think, wh whether it's a, an efficient way to raise money is one question, and we can debate that, but the second question is, does it actually do something about inequality, and my guess is it wouldn't. And the wealth tax has 
the same questions attached around it about uh, effectiveness. I would inter intervene in the labor market myself. Hiroshi? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, the questions are two. First, the Tobin tax. Uh, Tobin was actually uh, my thesis advisor at Yale, but anyhow, <laughs> as far as I understand, that the Tobin tax is on international capital mobility. The idea is to restrain the short run or short term, very frequent international capital uh, mobility to secure the stability of international monetary system rather than to mitigate the problem of income inequality in, in the economy. Um, so let me move on to the Piketty. Okay, I'm not opposed to uh, more progressive income tax or wealth tax, but I had occasion to see uh, uh, Mr. Piketty, Frenchman. Uh, I couldn't share his basic view of, of the economy, namely that uh, he very often times mentions in the talk and also in his book, rentier. By rentier, he means that uh, someone uh, who can live on uh, capital income, uh, he or she would inherit huge amount of uh, assets and he or she uh, doesn't have to work at all. Uh, simply can afford to live on capital income. Uh, that kind of person he calls rentier. And I'm sure that, that there are some rentier class in France, but there is no such person in Japan. He tries to, I try to explain and try to convince him. Okay, he very often mentions uh, national debt. I imagine that in France that, that there are some uh, people who own a huge amount of uh, national debt and simply can live on capital income. But in Japan, as you know, that the national debt are basically owned by you know, financial institutions, uh, nowadays including the, the Bank of Japan. And many people, of course, own deposit at banks. And who are those people? What are those people? Basically old, old men who are all be of, you know, workers. So all the workers are capitalists in Japan. And there is no such thing as uh, rentiers. But to repeat that, uh, you know, there would be a huge difference between France and Japan, you know, as a society. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, uh, Mr. Piketty, Professor Piketty has his own word of, uh, you know, based on France, I guess. But so I, I cannot really follow his uh, policy advice. And uh, it makes sense to apply his proposal to Japan. But as I said at the outset, I'm not opposed to more progressive uh, uh, income tax and perhaps some wealth tax. But there is a difference between Piketty and myself. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Just a, just a one minute. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm delighted to follow my colleague from Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. My name is Nancy Snow. You mentioned gender equality and gender inequality. Uh, I lecture all the time about nation brand Japan and Japan's leadership in the, role, in the world. And Japan is number one in so many categories. But we know Japan is really lagging behind in inclusion and diversity. And we see it today, even at the conference. <laughs> so gentlemen, <laughs> I would love to have you address uh, gender 
gender equality or gender inequality. I am noticing a trend in Japan that women of Japan are going overseas at a disproportionate rate at the high school and college level. You can look at the stats, 60, 70 percent. So they are becoming sort of default gender diplomats in the world. They are presenting a different image for Japan. Now, will these women come back and contribute to Japanese society? I hope so. That's what I'm here for, <laughs> to help encourage them. But I worry that they will feel left out of the conversation and the global dialogue if we don't have more equitable representation in that dialogue. So would you all like to address that? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. It allows me to uh, be, again, a self-centered marketing man by pointing out that my latest book, published in June in Jap Japanese, was about precisely this issue, um, about, and the, the Japanese title translated into English means, why, how women will determine the future of Japan. And it will be published next year in English, Japan's far more female future. Um, I believe absolutely that it's a crucial issue. Uh, I think that, uh, in seeing so few uh, women in a room like this, that principally reflects uh, the Japan in education of the 1970s and 1980s, where there was a huge gender gap in access to four-year university education. Uh, and so very few graduates of that time are in the sort of age group that are in leadership positions or past leadership positions. The change that took place in the 1990s and 2000s of a great increase in female access to four-year university education means that there's a supply, a, a huge increase of supply of, of tertiary educated uh, women coming through. The question is whether companies and other organizations, including universities, will adjust their uh, human resources strategies and policies in a way to, to uh, facilitate uh, the continued contribution of those women. I think that there are positive signs uh, that that is happening. There will be an increase, at least a doubling, probably more in the proportion of women in leadership positions over the next 10 years, but there should be a trebling, really, if organizations of all kinds really embraced this change, and I do think the intervention for work style reform is probably the most important, the most important government intervention that's happened so far to, uh, to, uh, to uh, encourage this. But there are other ones that can be done, including the tax, the tax penalty, in effect, for, 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 for marriage that exists here uh, a, 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 and others. But I'll hand on to others now. Yeah. Unlike Bill, I'm, I'm not prolific in writing books, but I will... Uh, I will take a little credit. In, in 1999, I believe it was, I was asked to testify the late Prime Minister Otsuji, uh, not Otsuji, um, sorry, Obuchi, thank you. Otsuji is a friend of mine, Obuchi. Um, <laughs> asked me, there was a commission on Japan in the 21st century, mm -hmm. and I was asked to testify, and my testimony was very simple. It was, Japan can afford to remain either racist or sexist, but not both. Um, meaning you had to either do immigration or you had to do female workforce integration. There was no progress made, and I gave a talk uh, on Davos in 2012 in which I made the exact same statement. Um, obviously, I was not alone uh, in making this statement. You and others have been talking about this. I think the reason I'm emphasizing that besides my bona fides is to say that, again, economics only gets us so far, right? So um, everything that was just said is very accurate, but then we see the cultural, ba you know, and, and a huge share of Japanese growth in the last few years is thanks to womenomics, is thanks to the several million women rejoining the workforce. Um, but you know, then we have the backlash of these pointed statements about women wearing eyeglasses or women wearing high heels or all these other things meant to make them feel unwelcome and, and denigrated in the workplace. 
And an analogous issue is true with African Americans, and particularly with female African Americans in the U.S. Um, and you know, there are studies done, which we've now seen in practice in Japan, and we do still in theory in the U.S. about the lost innovation, the lost skills, the lost human capital from these practices. But they're ultimately not economic. I, beyond what Bill rightly invokes about education, I would make two other points. Um, the first thing is, and we've seen this not just in Japan, but in Europe, one of the most power, and I believe Mr. Inaba has also mentioned this, one of the most powerful forces for mobilizing your workforce and your female labor supply is to provide more care for the elderly and for children through the state, going back to Bill's point. Um, we saw that make a huge difference in France and the Nordic countries. We saw it go the wrong way when East Germany was integrated into Western Germany. And Prime Minister Abe, to some degree, has pursued this, and I'd like to see more. The second thing is that we have to not allow the discussion of fertility and population growth, picking up on something Professor Yoshikawa said, to be used as a club to keep women down. Uh, one has to take it as given that in a rich democratic society, female fertility may not be necessarily as low as it is in Japan right now, but nobody should be trying to manipulate that back up. You have to get around that and get past that and, and make use of the human beings you have. So, that, I mean, that's the agenda, but you know whether we can get people to buy it is another question. Well, uh, thank you very much for raising the issue. Uh, I do recognize uh, the issue, I think, uh, simply because I have a good sample, let me, namely my daughter. My daughter in the, her 30s uh, works for a big company in Tokyo. So from her, I hear all sorts of problems. I'm a macroeconomist, but in, on this issue, you know, in micro terms, I collect all the programs and complaints from a working woman. So <laughs> I do recognize the issue. So there remain so many things to be done in this field. So thank you very much. I know what you mean. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, on that. So I don't think we need uh, the wrap-up conclusion. Maybe it will take three hours to go. And also, the, I found the panelists for the next session already alive to that. So they, now we are going to close this session. Please give the big hand to all the two panelists to that. <laughs> Ten minute break. Next session, a plenary session four will be held in this room. <laughs>